the Old Testament with my kids, and we've been reading daily in some of the Old Testament scriptures. We sit around the table, and we go around, and everybody reads a verse. I'll tell you, it was frustrating at the beginning, because not everybody can stay on the verse, and then you have to say, Sarah, verse 8, verse 8, and she has to start at the top and find verse 8. But I'll tell you, if you'll study the Bible with your children, not only will it come alive to their hearts, but it'll come alive to your heart. And the Lord's been really speaking to me about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not the most fun thing to study, especially parts of it. They can be boring and dry, and it seems like it goes on a long time, and not that much happens, and sometimes it seems like you go through a lot of everybody who begat everybody, and, and how they came to be, and how they're all connected, and sometimes you don't care, and you just want to kind of skim that part. Blip, blip, sevenite, sevenite, the herzatite, blah, 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 there we go, down to here, amen? Not going to say we don't do that, praise God, because we do. But how do we get to Jericho? You know, I've been looking in the Old Testament at the Israelites a lot, and God's been speaking to me about the Israelites. Because I would challenge that in America, we are the Israelites of the Old Testament right now. You know, you look at, look at Moses, and you look at, you know, even if you haven't read, even if you haven't read the Old Testament, everybody knows the story. You've seen the movie Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments. You know the story of how there was a people in captivity and they were God's people. For hundreds of years, they were made slaves. Doesn't that sound like our country a lot? For hundreds of years, they were slaves. Now, we had slavery in our country, and I will say that we had two kinds of slaves, the slaves that were the slaves and the slaves that owned the slaves because we were all in slavery together. We were enslaving ourselves out of God's will. Amen? So they were bound up in slavery. God delivered that people. And you wonder, looking from the outside, I've often thought, how on earth did a people who were brought out of slavery with the kind of miracles that they witnessed, who saw the plagues fall on the Egyptians but leave them alone, that saw the death angel come through and pass over them. I mean, it, in, the, in a cartoon or in a movie, it's one way, but imagine living that. And then you think, how could that same people end up wandering around the wilderness 40 years doubting God, how could that same people turn around and make some golden cow and fall down and worship it? How on earth do people do that? Why did they have to wander around for 40 years? These weren't just people. These were God's people. This was the church. It wasn't just your everyday run-of-the-mill guy out there. It wasn't people who worshipped another religion. This was the church. This was God's chosen people. You know, I, I've been thinking about that, and that's always baffled me about the Old Testament. I just think, man, God, those were some dumb people. I mean, they obviously, they weren't that bright. God's been showing me. He said, wow, I think if you look through history, and if you look at people in other parts of the world who are Christians, people who, like my cousin, who was an underground Christian in Russia, my cousin by marriage, she had to hide in an underground church. And she's told me the stories. Her name's Natasha, Natalia. She's told me the stories of how they would hide from the KGB and hide in their church, how they only had one Bible, part of a Bible, that the pastor had and would pass it around, and they would copy passages out of it to take home. She told me those stories. She told me all the stories about how she had to wait in the bread lines. When she first came to the United States, she was so amazed when my aunt took her to like one of those bakery thrift shops, and she said she just stood there and started crying at the front door and asked where the lines were and how much they were allowed to buy. She lived in a totally different experience. I, you know what she wonders? She wonders how a nation that had a ragtag army and came here for religious freedom that overthrew the greatest empire on earth because the Lord willed it for this nation to be born. How that same nation could fall into slavery, turn right around and fall into the sin of slavery. How that same nation 
that after God purged us of that th slavery, slavery through a war, could lose their footing again. How that same nation 50 years ago could start wandering in the wilderness, could kick God out of their schools, could mandate that children can be murdered, that could start defining life and family and marriages, whatever you feel like, that could disregard the Bible. And I would, I would propose to you that right now where we are as a nation, we are in the wilderness. We are the children of Israel. We have been there for more than 40 years. And God has really been birthing that in my heart, that that's where we are. And sadly, it's the church that's there. It's the church that's there. Because the divorce rate in the church is the same as the divorce rate in the world. Because we're now allowing in our churches homosexual ministers and homosexual marriage. Because we're allowing in our churches that it's okay if you have a little bit of sin. You know, it's okay if you're living together before marriage because it's just the normal accepted part of society now. I mean, we've got to make ourselves look like the world so the world will come to us. My husband's been my husband's been in a pastor's office that had a fridge stocked with beer and offered him one. How much do we have to make ourselves look like the world so the world will accept us? See, I don't see, see that Jesus ever did that. Jesus never looked like the world. People came to Jesus because they saw that what he had to offer was what better than what the world had to offer. What he had to offer was better than what they were living in. That's why they came to him. That's why they worshiped him. And church, if we'll get back to that in America, people will come and worship God again. So in Joshua, Moses has died. The Israelites have been out there 40 years. And God's time has come. And so in the first few chapters of Joshua leading up to the battle of Jericho, Joshua's, God is ordaining Joshua for his time. And he's beginning to get the people ready for what he's about to do. And I believe 100% in my heart that God is beginning to get the church ready for what he's going to birth in America. And the true church is going to come together and the church that isn't the true church is going to do one of two things. Some of them are going to fall away, and some of them are going to fight against it. And we better know that we know that we know what we believe. And we better be sure that we are on the side of righteousness. And we are better be sure that we are in line with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We better be sure that we are willing to stand up for what is right and what is godly in America. So Joshua, God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, you arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Joshua goes and tells the people. And the people say back to him, all that you command us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. I think that's funny, because they didn't heed Moses in all things. Amen? But they say the right thing. I remember them whining to Moses every other verse. They're whining that they don't have any food. Then they're whining they don't get like the food they got. They're whining that they can't get, they're stuck at the water. Then they're whining that they got over the water and God brought them through the Red Sea. Now what are we going to do? They're whining because they're afraid to go in to take what God's given them. Whoever rebels against your command and not, does not heed your words, the Israelites said, in all that you command him, we'll put him to death. Only you be, of, be strong and of good courage. 
See, that's what the world's waiting for. They're waiting for a church that is strong and of good courage. They're waiting for a church that is going to lead. Not wishy-washy this way and that way, whichever way the wind blows. We got to be seeker sensitive. Seeker sensitive, the worst words that ever came into the church. Seeker sensitive. Seeker sensitive means let's be mamby pamby around so you'll be my friend. Now there's nothing wrong with going out and meeting the lost where they are. Just don't act like them while you're there. Amen? Just love them, but don't live like them. That's what God's called us to do. He's called us to be in the world, just not of it. We got it backwards. We think we're just supposed to go out there and pal around and play around with sin just like them so they'll know that we're not that different and then they won't be afraid to come. That doesn't work. Because what ends up happening is the church falls into sin. You play around with sin, you fall into sin. That's what we've been doing for so long that we've gotten ourselves all confused. God is about to raise up a people in the United States. Some things are coming to our nation. I know this with all my being. Some things that are coming to our nation that are going to shake us from our foundation. It's already been happening to our economy with natural disasters. You guys know that firsthand. Things are changing. God's hand of protection is being moved back. Why? Because we need it to be moved back. God has allowed our wilderness experience. Why? Because we're not going to come back to him if he doesn't. He's allowed it. It's not because he doesn't love us. It's because he does love us. It's just like when you have a child. We're God's children. He treats us the same way. If I let my three kids run and do whatever they want, they're going to grow up to be spoiled, irresponsible brats who can't care for themselves, who can't hold a job, who can't keep a marriage together, who can't keep a family together, who can't teach their children to do the same. So I have to chastise them in love. I have to correct them. I have to bring them back. Sometimes I have to hurt them to help them because I love them. And we are the same with God. God had to hurt the children of Israel. Israel. He had to hurt them to get them where he needed them to be. I'm sure it wasn't comfortable wandering around and living in tents for 40 years eating the same stupid heavenly manna stuff that's fallen from the sky every meal of every day, eating the same dead birds that are falling down, the quail. It wasn't comfortable. But he did it because he loved them. So they send these, God says, all right, it's time. You've learned your lesson. Now what I've got to do is I've got to encourage you. And God is about to encourage us as a church. How does he do that? Our sister said this morning when she was leading worship, so prophetic, encourage yourself in the Lord, church. When you don't feel like you've got anything to give, when there's no words of praise that feel like they're coming out of your mouth, when everything is falling apart, that's the time you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. That means God There ain't no encouragement here. I got nothing. But I'm going to encourage myself in you, what I know you can do, and who I know you are. That's the way you encourage yourself. So the first thing God does is he sends these spies into Jericho. Now, there's two reasons he sent them there. One reason is because God wanted to save Rahab the harlot. God had no reason he had to send spies in there. He already had a plan. He already knew how he was going to conquer the city. He didn't really need the Israelites to do anything except obey. They never raised a sword. They never needed to know how many people were in there. They never needed to know anything. So why does he send spies in there to spy out a city that he knows they're never going to really do battle in because he's just going to tear it down for them? Well, he sends them in there for two reasons. One, he wants to save Rahab and her family. That's a whole other message. The second reason he sends them in there is because he wants to encourage them. What do they find out when they, he goes in there? 
It says the beginning of chapter two, it says the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring those men out who have come to you, who have entered our house for they've come to search out our country. But the women, Rahab takes the two men and hides them. And she says, uh, yeah, they came here, but I didn't know where they're from. And uh, so they, they ran out. We don't know where, I don't know where they went. So maybe you should run after them. I mean, it's kind of like an old cartoon, you know, where the, you know, the little cartoon where the cat runs and the mouse runs and nobody knows where they went. She's lying to the king because she's empowered by the spirit of God. She lies and she says, hey, hey, they went that way. Now she's really hiding them in her own house, but they went that way. Go chase them. And they do, they go chase him. So she comes up to the roof where the men are and she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on all the people, and that all the inhabitants of Jericho are faint-hearted because of you, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red, Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, who you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone in Jericho because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Amen. So these spies, what do they do? They go in there. They're sneaking around, they're hiding, they're trying to see how are we going to attack this city, but instead, they end up going into this harlot's house, hiding on the roof, and really the only thing they accomplish is bringing back the message that this woman tells them. She says, everybody here is terrified. We heard what God's done for you. We heard about the Red Sea. We know that your God is real. And our hearts have melted. Our king is terrified. We know that you're going to overthrow us. That's why God sent him. Next morning, they get up. And God tells them, he says, all right, you're going to cross over the Jordan. Now, at this time, if you study the word, you'll find out that the, nobody was going to cross the Jordan because this was the time when all the rains came and it flooded. So everybody kind of feels like they're safe because you wait till the water's gone down, then you cross over. But he says, we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, 12 men, we're going to carry the Ark, you're going to step on the water, and the water's going to be held back, and you're all going to go over on dry land. Why did God do that? Because 40 years ago, he did that for them. And so he was encouraging them, again, not just with the testimony of the lady, but he was encouraging them with, remember what I did for you. Remember 40 years ago when your nation, thousands of you, came out of slavery and crossed over the water? Well, we're going to do it again. We're going to remember. We're going to cross over this river, and I'm going to stop the water for you again. Because after 40 years, I want you to know that I'm still your God. I still love you. I still do the same miracles. So they crossed over. Joshua, you know, he's got to be feeling pretty good, right? He says to the people, he says, God told me we're going to take 12 of you. We're going to get stones and we're going to sit them here. We're going to call these memorial stones. And you know what we're going to do? He talks about this all in chapter 4. He says, we're going to remember what the Lord has done. He says, cross over before the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel. There were 12. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask you in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you will answer to your children that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So the people cross over. Chapter 4 and chapter 5, they begin to go back after that. See, they're encouraged now. They've, they've heard a report of what God's going to do. They've seen a miracle of what God's going to do for them now. And then they've built a memorial to remember all God's done for them in the past. Just in, in two short days' time, after 40 years of mess 
and sin and crazy and lost. In two days time, see how quickly God changes their situation? In America, God is going to quickly change the situation of the church. He is going to quickly usher us into a new time. Then, just in case Joshua's worried, an angel appears to him. Joshua wasn't sure, you know, he's over by Jericho, he looks up and he sees a man, and Joshua says, are you for us, or are you for our enemies? He says, no, I'm not for either one of you. As for commander of the armies of the Lord, I have come. He tells him, he asks him, what does, is God saying to me to do? And the angel says, take off your sandals because you're on holy ground chapter six see i've often wondered what makes a people crazy enough to march around a big walled city for seven days in a row and scream really what makes a people crazy enough to do that see god wants to get us to the point as a church where we're crazy enough to do that and not just do it like, ooh, ooh oh, yay, it was fun, and I felt dumb. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I've, I've been in churches where we had Jericho marches, and when I was a kid, the evangelist made us all march around seven times, and everybody had to scream at the end. That's what happens if you grow up Pentecostal, and you're like eight years old. You're like, you know, you're eight years old in 1982. That's it, baby. <laughs> and... And I remember those days. And you know what I remember? I remember, oh, we're marching around at the end. Woo! <laughs> Let's all sit down. <laughs> feel pretty dumb now. But boy, these people, they were so sure. They had so much confidence in who God was and what he was about to do for them that they're marching around that city. And I'll tell you what. You know, I've seen the little veggie tail have you ever seen it? Where they march around and, and the little peas are up there and the French peas and they're taunting him. Oh, you're so stupid. You know, you will knock down our wall, keep marching, you know, and they're, and they're singing. But I'll tell you what, I don't think that's what was really happening. That makes a good cartoon. But if you read what Rahab said, these people were terrified of the Israelites and they knew about God's miracles. I'll tell you what, I bet they were hiding. I bet they're shaking in their boots. I, they're thinking, who are these crazy people and what is God about to do? You know, the first day they're probably like, they're marching out there. Better go hide. They're just marching around. That's it. March around, blow a trumpet. Then they left. What are they going to do now? They're probably staying awake all night waiting for the surprise attack. They're terrified. They have no idea what God's going to do. Second day, they come back. They march around again. Third day, I'll tell you what. If that kind of a crazy person was outside marching around with all the confidence they had, I would be terrified. I would be so terrified. I would say, okay, what's going to happen? Our hailstone's going to fall from the sky and wipe us out. Fire going to erupt everywhere. What's God going to do? Because these are the people... God held the whole sea back for them. How'd they even get here? How did they get here? They're not even wet because the Jordan River's like this high. How'd they get over here? All of them. I mean, there a million questions are running through their mind. And the greatest thing of this whole chapter that the Lord spoke to me about, they go around one day, they blow their trumpets. The people don't make a sound. They go around day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. They don't go around once. They go around seven times. God's perfect number, seven times. They go around seven times, and on the seventh day, seventh time, on the seventh day, they all start screaming. But they didn't scream because the walls fell down. They screamed because they knew they were going to. They shouted before the miracle. And church, that is the most important part of the whole story. They had the confidence in who the Lord was, in what he had done for them, in what he was going to do for them. They remembered 
God, and that's what God's calling us to do as a church. God is calling us right now to remember who he is. God is calling us to live like we know who he is. I can look back in my life, and I'll tell you, the last year for us has been a rough one. I don't know how many of you are from here, but honey, move to New York City from the Midwest, and that is a rude awakening. I love this city with all my heart, but I'll tell you what, it's taken me a long time to understand why people here are how they are, and I'm sure people who see me are like, what you acting that way for? <laughs> I mean, people think I'm crazy sometimes the way I act. I get honked at for letting people cross, because where I live, if you pull up to a store and people are trying to go, you know, especially like old ladies, you just stop, and you just let them go. Man, I... I, I could have been killed for that a couple times, letting somebody walk across the street. It has been a rough year. It has been a rough year for us financially. I gave up my job, so we didn't have one job. Now we have two jobs, now just one job, and it costs twice as much to live here. Trust me, it costs twice as much to live here. <laughs> and so this year has been a year where I have had no choice but to encourage myself in the Lord. See, I go back and I remember, have remembered what God has done. I remember the miracles that have come that I have witnessed in my life. I remember how my middle daughter here, Victoria, that's downstairs, I remember being in that hospital room and the doctor saying when she was one year old and weighed 10 pounds, take her home and let her die at home. I remember that. And I remember God's healing. I remember the times that we were in churches or somewhere and the Lord said, empty out your bank account because you don't have enough money to pay your bills and give it in that offering. And then God sustained us because of our obedience, because we did not trust in our checkbook, but we trusted in the Lord. I remember the times I failed and God's forgiveness and grace and mercy were there for me anyway. I remember the times I did not believe in him. I remember the times I sinned against him and he forgave me. And so I have begun over the last year to lay down my memorial stones before the Lord and remember. And God has continued as I've done that to strengthen me and encourage me and he has continued to work miracles on my behalf. And I'm telling you right now, church, I know this is a word for us in this hour. We need to be so full of the boldness and the confidence of the Lord that nothing will be able to shake us. Nothing will be able to shake us. No financial, no financial crisis that comes our way, and I'm not just talking about in the church, but I'm talking about in your home. No financial crisis will be able to shake us. No health issue. In this last year, right soon after we moved, within a few weeks of when we moved, my husband's father was diagnosed with cancer and not a good prognosis. And my mother had to have emergency heart surgery and they gave her a 50-50 chance of surviving the surgery. We were hit because the devil didn't want us to come here. He wanted us to turn tail and go back home. We were hit when... We weren't, when it didn't work with our finances, when it didn't work with the, our friendships and situations, when it didn't work with the health of our children, he just moved on to the next thing. And we stood there and we said, we will trust in the Lord our God. Both our, my mother and David's father are healthy and doing very well. I will remember what the Lord has done for me. And it will fill me with the confidence and the boldness to walk around a city, to walk around this city. And when God tells me to, to scream my lungs out. Not because I'm an idiot, not because some evangelist told us to because it seemed like a good idea, but because I know when God tells me to and I do it, that the walls of that city will, will fall down.
your sacrifice. God doesn't need your sword. God needs your faith. He needs your confidence in who he is. He doesn't need your confidence in what you can do on your own. He needs you to realize that without him, we can't do anything on our own. He's the very air that you're breathing right now. He is the force that is holding all those tiny little molecules in your body together. And I'll tell you, with one breath, one thought from God, literally you could fall apart and melt onto the floor. Do you realize that? He is upholding the entire universe with his hand. With the word of his power, with the strength of his hands. What is man that he is mindful of us? That he cares so deeply about you? I just want to challenge you this morning to start building up your confidence in who God is and to stop looking at who you are. Because if I look at myself, there's a lot of things I see that I don't like. And I'm serious. I don't like that I'm too quick to be angry. I don't like that I get grumpy and tired and don't ever let me take a 20 minute nap when I'm really tired and try to wake me up because I'm like a bear that's just been let out of a cage. My husband knows that about me. It's better for me just to stay awake. Don't let me sleep for a half hour. That's a bad deal. I'm not one of those power nap people who can jump right back. I don't like that about myself. I don't like it that sometimes I'm short tempered with my children. I don't like it that sometimes I'm lazy. I don't like it that sometimes I eat too much, more than I want to admit. It's on my New Year's list. I don't like it that sometimes I'm not the person that God wants me to be. And if I spend my life focusing on all the sometimes that I'm not who God wants me to be, instead of focusing on the heart that I have to become all that he wants me to be. I will never do anything for God. I have to cut off that part of my flesh. I have to turn off that part of my brain. I have to ignore those negative voices that are mostly just me. And I have to stand there and look at who he is and believe in what he can do in and through me and believe in what he can make me into. I have to stop looking at our nation and saying, man, we're just all going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> I mean, we're a mess. God's never going to do anything. You know, I, I have to stop watching the well-meaning commentators who are just arguing over every little political thing and, and talking about what's right and what's not right. Who cares about what's right and what's not right, what's Republican and what's not Republican? Let's start, and what's Democrat. Let's start looking at what's righteous and what's not. And if we'll move our country in the, in the path of righteousness, none of the other stuff will matter. God is not Republican and he is not a Democrat. He has no political party. He doesn't, he doesn't care. What king ever cared about the political parties? He's Lord. He doesn't need anybody else. See, we think in our country that we can legislate truth and that whatever we define on our law books, on our pieces of paper, is the truth of what we are. But the truth is, those laws were already written down a long time ago. And nothing we write today will ever change them. So let's ignore what has been. Let's realize that we're in the wilderness church. Let's not worry about all the unsaved people who are in the wilderness because I'll tell you why they're there. They're there because the church led them into it. 
the church led us into the wilderness with our apathy, with who we became. And God is calling us to come out of the wilderness. And we start that by building up our confidence who he is. I believe in 2014, I know with all my heart, and I know my husband and I have talked about this a lot and how God's been speaking to us. We're not the only people God's been speaking to by far. But you can ask a lot of preachers, a lot of prophets, and a lot of men of God, and they will all tell you that they know that we are on the cusp of God waking our nation up and bringing us out of our wilderness experience. And we have to make sure that we know who we're, we are in Christ. I'm going to ask my husband to come back up here. I just feel like today there's a lot of us who need to remember who we are in Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people here today that are like me. Maybe it's more a, I don't know, maybe it's more a woman thing. You know, there's times when I'll just be sitting in my bed when I'll start to feel discouraged, and I will literally replay the voices of negative comments that people have said to me over the years. And I will stop myself and realize, whoa, that is not God talking to me. Why am I listening to it? You know, when that happens, God wants us to encourage ourselves in the Lord. If, if there is a voice in your head or your heart that is tearing you down, either because of other people's opinions of you or because of past sins that you've committed, be assured that it's not the voice of the Lord. Because if you've repented of those sins, God doesn't even remember what they are by his own choosing. So how could he be reminding you of them? And no negative thoughts or comments are from him. But God wants you to encourage yourself in he, who he is and all that you can be in him. Amen. Amen. Stand with us if you would and we'll have a time of prayer. Hallelujah. Father, we just ask that you would move in a great and awesome way here. We thank you for your word that's been spoken. We thank you for moving. We thank you for doing something new and something fresh in our hearts. Father God, we just ask that you would fill us. You would change us, that you would use us, Lord.